All of our files are free and will remain free. If you like the show, you can show support by donating $1 to help with expenses. Just use the PayPal link on our website, YouTube channel, or Facebook page. Thanks. And welcome back to part two of our program today with Alex Securis of Skeptico battling evil. And I left you guys on a cliffhanger, a high note, uh, introduced child sacrifice. And we're going to go there. But I, I want to say to you, or ask you first, Alex, Okay. there is one guest you haven't had on who, when it comes to this subject will surprise you to know that he's an expert. And I've had private conversations with him and I cannot talk on air about it because it cannot be known, these things, because it can be abused. But he's really delved into the concept of evil. And oh he, man, you're kind of, you're, you're cliffhangering me now. Well, yeah. Who is it? Doctor in theology, Joseph Farrell. Of course. And you wouldn't know because I never talked on air about it with him and you haven't done uh, the same fanatical listening to him as I did. But he had some shows in the early days where I picked up on, where he explained, for example, the reason for sacrifice. Uh, you know, would you say that what the Aztecs did was evil? I think it was. And I think it had to do with spirit possession as, you know, has been documented by like Graham Hancock, I think, does a great job of documenting that in his books. Yeah, I, I kind of agree. The energy was certainly serving evil. But you know that the victims were happy. They were like ecstatic. Oh, I'm chosen. They were, often they were brought up for that. And also the sacrifice. So they, didn't, they weren't aware that they were participating in an evil process. Isn't that interesting? try to transfer it to today i think this i, I think if, if we wander into the whole cult thing uh we could spend a lot of time there which i think is super interesting and the yeah, will exactly. but you know i mentioned child sacrifice for a very important reason because you want to go all the way to the causes and the answers and i wanted to tango around a little with um, more mainstream aspects just to do our duty to visit them, not go straight to the crazy stuff down the rabbit hole, and also to show that we are aware of it. But let us go all the way down to the rabbit hole then, since you're teasing me with it. <laughs> okay. And then I would ask you, first of all, what is the child sacrifice, however you conceive it, what is the core essence behind that concept? I don't know. What, what, where are you? What are you thinking? I'm thinking innocence. Uh huh. That's the whole point. Uh -huh. Yes, that's yes, the whole yes. point. Okay. A violation of innocence. Right. Okay. Now I'm gonna. I'm not gonna reveal, but I'm gonna. If you, if the people are very perceptive, can pick up something. So, you have cultures like the Aztecs, for example. You have cultures like modern America. Modern America is doing exactly the same thing as the Aztecs. Only people are not seeing it. They are daily killing children, women and children, and all, all the things you can think of. They have so, certain zones in the world which is assigned for experimenting with their weapons, where there's no oversight, where people are brutalized daily. And of course, that also generates evil locally, because people who grow up in such areas also... Uh, perpetuate that energy towards each other, right. which is why you get beheadings and whatnot. But anyway, here's the point. You have cultures any time in existence that do stuff like that. Uh, and either they are doing it because they know something and want to attain something, or they are just useful idiots for forces who want to attain something. So, right? So it's not a question of how much do they know about it? How much do the Catholic Church know about the evil they did? It doesn't matter if there's an objective force, because then it, it is, and it doesn't matter as much if they're aware of it or if they're just doing their bidding. Now, yeah. let me introduce this. So let's say in existence, 
if you block the light, I love that um, concept. If you block the light, there is like a, a battle here then between those who seeks to split and split and split down to microcosmos, down to the smallest grain of matter, follow the ego, not the whole. And there's those who want to go back to the one, uh, the whole. And that's where empathy and stuff like that comes. I'm not saying, I mean, total one point or total the other point is probably not practical on this earth. You have to have a certain amount of egoism just to uh, live, right? So we are in a twilight world between these forces. It's not evil to eat right, right. because you need to eat, etc. Okay, but here's the thing. This other doesn't have light. So what if it sustains itself by creating shocks on the astral plane? They explode because we have the godly power. They can't go uh, directly to the Creator, but they can go to us who are deluded and don't know our own birth and don't know what's going on. We don't even know who we are or how powerful we are. So if you can traumatize someone, so it's because why, why are they bothering to torture and linger on before they go for the kill? <laughs> right? Why not just kill like animals do? Honest, fair, straight, effective. Because See, but you, goal. You've, you've laid so much, you've, you've opened up so many avenues that I think are, are really terrific. Yeah, let me just complete just one more thing I want to add. Yes, yes, no, please. So, please go ahead. so they create this shock, like an astral explosion is going off. And then that energy is harvested. Uh, it's, it's going into circulation for their aims, you know, to sustain themselves because they, they are like vampires. If you study myths, myths are excellent books of memories, not literal like the morons think. They think everything is literal, ancient aliens, etc. No, no, no. They are a map of this energy we're talking about now. The psyche, you can call it. The cosmos, you can call it. So interesting thing about vampires if a vampire is outside your door, should you be afraid? I don't, I don't know what that... Tell me. No, no. There's no uh, reason to be afraid because he can't enter, right? Why can't he enter? Mm. Tell me. Because you haven't invited him in. Mm. Mm -hmm. So that goes directly to the concept of free will. And we can't discuss evil without introducing free will. But we let that rest now. I want to go back to the recirculation of energy. Now you had comments or, or, or replies. I want to hear them. Well, again, I feel like we've just taken, taken in the world, which is awesome. Because I, I like how you wind up at free will, which I think is kind of one of the fundamental questions that we have. I'd again like to frame this up because this is what's so important to me and I think is so lacking yeah. is that you've just laid out a map, right? So there's the territory and then there's the map, how we navigate the territory. And you've said, hey, here's a potential way to navigate. Here's an ontology. Here's a set of principles right. in terms of how this might work. And I'm saying that's what we have to move towards. And I keep pointing out that we have to wake up out of how how we're, we've been duped into thinking that we don't have to think about this. We give. I know, but we're doing it now, aren't we? <laughs> we are. Yeah, but we are. But look at our look at our our again. I I know I got to go on this rant, but I I have to, and then I'll get back to the point. Sure. It's like you can't have this conversation, a serious conversation within academia. It is non-existent, and I've tried. You know the number of religious scholars I've spoken with on this show? It's embarrassing how they've completely ignored it. And then we've already talked about Well, you haven't had Dr. Farrell on. He he's, he's a religious scholar who will go there. He, he'll, he'll go there, but he doesn't. What are his uh, current academic affiliations? No, he's a freelancer today. Right? You're right. I, I, yeah. That's my point. Mm. So when I talk to, uh, uh, you know, in the book— when I talk to uh, Hugh Urban, poor, he's like the punching bag in my book, and he's really not a bad guy at all. But, you know, in the religious studies department at Ohio State University, or I talk to uh, Brian Hayden, who's on the Royal Society of Anthropology in uh, uh, Canada, or I talk to uh, Dr. Gregory Shushan, who does a cross-culture work on near-death experience. I could go on and on and list over and over the people that have the academic credentials. They understand that they can't talk about this. They talk around it and then when you bring them to anything close to talking about it they 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 just like pause like you realize i can't say anything about that i can't publish anything about that that i am 
completely have to be married to this materialistic, biological robot, mm -hmm. meaningless universe kind of thing. So, yes, we're going to talk about it, but I think we have to continue to say that, you know, you and I aren't going to solve this problem today. <laughs> but what we can maybe do is point out that there are a lot of brilliant minds out there mm -hmm. that are intentionally being bridled from even talking about this in a serious intellectual way. But back to your map, I would, I would challenge your map or not even challenge it, Al. I would just throw out a different map, a different way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. The way that I understand the force thing and the evil thing and the good thing is that, again, what if we saw the darkness as not this great force if you will, but just a manifestation of the light in a way that allows there to be contrast, that allows there yeah. to be shadow. Yeah. And that our misunderstanding of that is that we think our attraction to that is somehow real. And all it really was, was a way for us to have a better outline of the silhouette. And I think that changes everything from the idea that that force needs an energy and needs to send shock waves and all the rest of it. No, it's no, just it's the same thing. The ancients said uh, uh, used the moon as an exactly example of what you said, because what's the feature of the moon? The moon lights up in darkness, right? Yeah. But it's not its own light. It's a reflection of the sunlight. And for them, that was the metaphor of what you exactly said. So this is known, what you're saying. Of course. I, I am not saying anything that hasn't been said a million times. No, no, no. But, but that's not even my point. My point is that when I say it's known, I meant it's integrate. It's not, it, it's, it fits with what uh, I told you about energy being recirculated. It's not a contrast to it. It's a part of it. You see? I do. I do. And, and uh, I, I'll take it further. Gurdjieff said that the uh, moon consumes souls. Plutarch said that when we die, we are beamed up to the moon, where we are going through a second death, where a part of us is being peeled off and either bounced back to Earth or integrated cool. with the moon. That's where all, all our death traumas comes from. It's the stay on the moon. Blavatsky said it was a corpse in dissolution, millions of years old, dead planet. And then you have, uh, do you know the chap, uh, what's it called again? He's big in UFO circles. Uh, he was a CIA pilot. He talked about exactly the same thing, only in materialistic terms. He said aliens had towers, soul-sucking towers on the moon. Oh my God. <laughs> I know it sounds far-fetched, but it's it's just a modern uh, interpretation of an ancient idea. I don't think he even was aware of the ancient ideas. And he said that they try to keep us trapped. These tangents, the archons, obviously. Yeah. They try to keep us trapped here in this hypnosis in the, on this earth. Like a prison planet. And when we die, they suck us up with these towers and, you know, do whatever they do so we don't remember anything and they throw us back. So the moon has always been connected to death. It's been connected to evil. It's been connected to the reflected light, etc. So here's, here's, so that's awesome, right? That's awesome in line with what we're talking about. Yeah. You know what I think we can introduce that I want to get your take on is, and, and I, I, I kept saying, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to talk about the manifestations of evil because it just gets kind of. No, we should. We get lost in it and then we can never get out and people get hung up on the satanic ritual abuse and, you know, what kind of, what color robes were they wearing yeah. and what were they, yeah. what grimoires were they reciting and all the rest of this. And I, I guess the first point that I'd have on that is I think it's interesting to look at a couple of the memes that seem to pop up again and again in these darker evil realms, you know, this, this attraction to the darkness, to the soul crushing thing. And, and one of them is this idea of, I, I like to always say opposite day, you know, my kids were growing up, I must watch 10,000 episodes of SpongeBob SquarePants, the cartoon, you know, 
And one of my favorites is, is, is I love SpongeBob, but, you know, opposite day. And he goes over to Squidward's house and Squidward is always being annoyed that, you know, SpongeBob is bothering him. So his way of brushing him off is saying, hey, it's opposite day, SpongeBob. And SpongeBob then just spins off and is just doing the opposite of what he wanted to do, which is what Squidward thought would get him off his back. Mm-hmm. Man, to me, that's the whole that's the whole uh, devil satanic thing. Yeah. That's the do what thou wilt, Alistair Crowley nonsense. Anyone, you got? We got to go there. We have to explore that. Okay. And it's this idea that by breaking the taboos of our culture, by going against the grain in the most severe way, whatever is the morality, we do the opposite of it. If anyone studied history, you get to the Sabbatean Frankist cult of a million people, a million Jews in Europe who were a part of this cult, who, this is real history, right, folks, that then followed this, whatever the, 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 our rules say whatever the Torah is, we should do the opposite. Why? Because God is coming when all are good or all are bad. And we know we will never have a time when all are good. So, hey, let's expedite God coming by <laughs> doing all that's bad and making all bad. This is a motif, clearly something that's being generated by some darker force, but this plays itself out again and again and again in our culture and no one sees, seems to see it. And that would even launch us into, you know, a conversation about the CIA, about Peter Lavenda, about George Webb, who I don't think is playing that game and then will be crushed because he's not playing that game and Gloria Steinem and the rest. Yeah, uh, Lavenda mentioned one of those pedo cults. Uh, I think it was called the Finders Group, who was... Look, the whole investigation was shut down because they were connected to CIA. But no, let's go to manifestations because we have to look for common denominators if we're going to solve anything and not just be headless chickens running around uh, in panic here, right? And a <laughs> common denominator is, I believe, what I introduced. It's innocence. That's soul crushing. Uh, why do they need virgins? Why do they need, I, I'm not saying anyone's doing it, but in the myth, in the meme, it's the, oh, the Satanists are sacrificing virgins. Why? W- why do they need purity? Why not take an old hooker? Why would they think, why would we think they're not doing it if they say they're doing it? Because nobody's saying they're doing it. They're saying someone else is doing it. <laughs> why would we think Alistair Crowley isn't doing it when he says he's doing it. Why do we think Damien Eccles is not doing it when he says he's doing it? This is a deception that wouldn't pass the Smith, the, the sniff test any more than that email you got from that Nigerian prince that just (laughs) needs a couple thousand dollars to unlock his millions. We wouldn't believe it. If anyone told us it in any other sense, why do we believe it here? Okay. Well, let's go there, but we're not done with uh, the important point of you. You missed the point of innocence. Why do it? We have to ask that question. What's the function of doing it? Why aren't they uh, doing like Dexter, killing the evil people? Why aren't they uh, uh, raping old hookers or something? So there's a common denominator here, if you can see it. And what uh, does the purity, the innocence, what does that symbolize? What What is that the principle of? Keep going. I, I, I want to hear where you're going with this. Well, I actually want to hear what you're thinking about this, but, but I think it's rather agreeable to say that it's a manifestation of the light. Mm. So, so they are blocking the manifestation of the light, the better manifestation, the better symbol of it, expression of it, the better. A child, a baby, a virgin, someone innocent, something pure, how can we defile it? It's the same in pedophilia, right? How can we defile it? No, I, I, I get you. Right. So why do we have to, to throw all these people into the volcano? There's something going on there. And if you're not looking into that, you're missing the whole point. I'd suggest, again, get Joseph Farrell on the show. Because if you want to go to the real existential questions, 
where we discuss these things as realities and try to see principles behind that makes reason out of this, then we can't be afraid. Then, then we can't just get lost in, in the manifestations and the pop culture and all that stuff. Because you said in our culture, no, it's not in our culture. It's in whole of mankind's existence. Oh, well, I, I certainly agree it's in many cultures. Would love to have Joseph Farrell on the show. We'll lean on you to make that happen. Oh, sure. Warning, skeptical warning. I'm going to push him on some of his ideas that I don't think stand up historically, but I love that he's such a broad thinker and can talk about concrete examples. Yeah, but don't waste the time with him. If you want to discuss evil with him, you should do it. And then push him on what he says. Well, hold on, because here's the here's the point about what you're saying, yeah. and, and I think there's a there's an inherent kind of sticky point here with the manifestations of evil. So take what you're saying, and th- it it rings true to a certain extent, right? So yeah. I wish to defile in the embodiment of the light in order to play the opposite game, and the opposite game is the meme that's been orchestrated by the darkness to make me kind of distort and defile everything. Yeah, that can explain how, how you can get people to do it, but it doesn't explain the aim. The aim isn't just a symbolic because, game. Because, and, and what my point would be to that, I would hypothesize that don't get too hung up on the aim because as we can all experience in our own minute by minute experience, we can think of all sorts of kooky reasons for doing no, Okay, okay, okay. No, not the aim of, of the guy who actually puts it. I don't care what the drone, the, the bomb dropping pilot thinks. So you're going to go, you're going to go to the next level and then you're going to uh, say, yeah, I want to know why, why someone, the hierarchy yeah, why, why is the bomb dropped? The hierarchy of evil and you're going to go up the demon yeah. ladder and then you're going to say there's some aim yeah. and I'm going to say it's the same freaking thing that you just talked about before, which is that why do we think when we climb that ladder down, we're going to find some fundamental truth. If we, if you and I are in sync on the big picture, that it's really just about the light and it's really just about blockages of the light, then it's just what we can see here. I mean, there's some people that play dupes for good and there's some people that play dupes for evil, right? Yeah. So when we talk about the fundy Christian at the bake sale, who's just following blindly what they're told to do and they're part of the uh west uh what's that uh the church in uh the baptist church in you know that holds up the signs god hate, hates fags you know <laughs> well they're in a they're in a christian church they're studying the bible they're doing god's work but they're out on the street waving to people god hates fags god hates fags well mm-hmm. the, the, are they you know, let's go up that path. Are they ascending or are they descending? Right. So I don't get too worked up about the the idea that there's this other level of evil that is so much more powerful and meaningful because I look at it in my own life and say, gee, it looks just like another manifestation of shadow and I don't want to get too hung up on that. What I want to do is figure out how to integrate my shadow's in all the ways that you're talking about, because when I do even a little bit, when I can relax and release and let go of some of that stuff, even a little bit, it gives me more freedom in my life. It gives me more ability to act in a way that just feels better throughout my entire being. Yeah, it brings you closer to the light, basically. But uh, my point is evil, the darkness, whatever, the, the the function of it, uh, of how it manifests, because we have to understand it, is uh, to sustain itself. In other words, it's and, like, and that's where I'm saying I don't I don't agree. I, I'm not saying I disagree with that. Mm. I'm offering a different model. Is that no? It doesn't need to sustain itself because its whole purpose for being there was just to be this this silhouette, this point of contrast. So it was the light that allows that to play on the playing field, but to misidentify it as some force that is in opposition to the light, I think changes the whole game in a way that, that doesn't, doesn't really, doesn't really work. So it's just, we're just playing around here. And that's what I think the darkness and the light is just playing around. It's really about the light. The light is what allows the darkness to even come into existence. Mm. Well, um, the Gnostics wouldn't agree, uh, and they're not alone. Uh, see, 
if there's, you could say the ultimate cause is, let's say there's a neutral uh, cause to this, creates the light and then the darkness with its intention. Yeah, in the ultimate scheme of things, there would be, but that force wouldn't care about how small bits of existence would experience, uh, oh, evil is so bad, I curse you evil, they wouldn't care. But the light would care. My point is that if it, if it needs to sustain itself, then it's just having a very bad deal, actually. It's like the demon who works in hell and, and doesn't like his job but doesn't have any choice. Right. It's not evil per se in their perspective because if you, if you could save the earth by going to another earth and kill babies on that other earth. <laughs> I don't know if you would do it, but some would probably do it. And it would be a very bad job. But they were doing it to save all the babies on earth. So my, my point of understanding evil and its function is that if we want to deal with it, we need to understand why it exists, how it exists, and then how can can we use that to Unexist it, so to speak. So that's just a philosophical point. If you want to go to the so let's let's take it from a philosophical point to a pre scientific point, and this okay. that's what this whole thing is about for me. What this whole project is about, because we all love philosophy and the power that it brings to these thought experiments, but we also love science and we love yep. the ability to try and the best we can measure things, analyze things, even if we understand the limitations of it. So here's what I propose. Mm -hmm. Look at the near-death experience content. Look at it across cultures. Look at it repeatedly with scientific surveys that ask multiple questions in multiple ways, you know, in the same way we ask people about surveying their health or depression or anything else, and see how the data starts to fall out and see what we can discern from that. When we do, we get a model that looks more like my model than your model. I'm just saying mm. that's where the data is, that there is God, that there is a hierarchy, and that all the manifestations of the darkness are a part of this lesson process. This is not my conclusion. This is the conclusion of the data, in particular, Jeff Long, who's collected the largest database. But are you surprised? Because... Who, who, well, let me add one more. Let me throw yeah. one more on the pile because I've done it. I, I did it before, but I'll, I'll bring it back yeah, again. Yeah. So again, we're, we're trying to get out of the philosophical to the pre-scientific. So we look at near-death experience and that's where it points. Now we go over to this guy, Tom Zinzer. He's a clinical psychologist. And what is he telling us in his kind of controlled experiment, if you will, with hundreds and hundreds of people? He says, it's all about going to the light. It's all about bringing people yeah. to the light. And everyone I've encountered can go to the light. And there are some beings who don't want to go to the light, who are afraid of the light, or for all these different reasons. But everyone has the ability, every soul has the ability Absolutely. to go to the light. This is a different, and I have to kind of draw this point out, see what you think. No, that's my model too. But that is a different ontology. That is a different map than the darkness has a force that is equal to the light. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah I agree with that. But the darkness doesn't. That's why the darkness needs to fuck with the light, because it doesn't have its own force. Otherwise, it wouldn't need to create these manifestations of trauma and pain. It's given all the force it needs by the light. The, the light says, here's your force. It's all you need. That's enough. Go for it. Well, if you take, yeah, in principle, but if you actually bring the light anywhere in the universe, you can be in the darkest spot of the universe. You just need a lighter and you kill the darkness there. That's how weak darkness is on its own. So if it's that weak, I don't blame it for trying to make up schemes to sustain itself and survive by distracting or seducing people who has lighters, people who am of the light. If, if that's the only gas it can get, that's how it has to go about. Yeah. But are you surprised that the people who have these experiences... Uh, that you, you get these reports because these reports are all coming from current human beings and current human. Well, uh, yeah? Again, you know, the, the, I just threw out 
very briefly, and I respect and, and really appreciate his work, but there's a guy named Dr. Gregory Shushan, and what he's done is done a cross-culture, cross-cultural analysis of near-death experience, and not just cross-culture, but cross-time. He's gotten right. some very old accounts, very important. hundreds of years old accounts. Yes. And from that, I mean, it's not a clear picture, but some things do start to emerge. And exactly. back to my point, you know, I keep pounding on the same thing. Mm. Hey, folks, that's quote unquote scientific. Why is it just this one guy who's done this one <laughs> book? Why don't we have a man on the moon effort to try and understand catalog and understand those experiences? But we don't. Is that part of the deception? Is that part of the plan? Is the look away head fake thing that you mentioned in academia and is religion? Is that part of the deception? I think it is. Like deliberate, like a conspiracy? <laughs> yeah, like a deliberate conspiracy. Uh, exactly. Okay, okay. I don't know about that. Maybe. But I, I know that most people uh, who manifest idiotic things are idiots basically but is is the catholic church a conspiratorially driven organization yeah, it is is it okay perfect so it's not a few bad apples mm, it's um, it's a systematic it it yeah. there's it, the manifestation of it as we see it is oh there's a bad apple oh well, there's another bad apple yeah, yeah, yeah. it's systemic at some yeah. point yes at some point we go it's systemic it's somehow institutionalized. No, but it's a perfect metaphor. I think it's the same on Earth. Most of the people who dust the stuff are working for an energy they are not, and some succumb to it and become manifestations. It's the same as the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church wants to sustain itself. It wants power. It doesn't want to die out in this modern world. And so I think many of the so-called conspiracies are... People. I mean, there may be. Well, a but what you just described is is part of this evil thing, right? I mean, th that that we would categorize. There is an intent there, but the intent isn't carried by the minions. If you see what I mean. I do. I do. It's but, systemic, and it's bigger than the minions. Right, but but that intent, that intent is is this evil. Some people call it satanic, whatever. That is the that is that impulse, right? That impulse to control, to deceive, to say one thing and do another. You know, I mean, that's what we're witnessing with the with what we're talking about inside the Catholic Church. And the, I agree with your point. You know, it, it has to be made that there there are plenty of people who are experiencing the light through their Catholic faith mm. because. That seems to be another property. The light is the light doesn't care. Exactly. You know, the light, there, so you, there's plenty of people that are studying Aleister Crowley. And even though he was a despicable human being by all accounts and was trying to do everything he could to block the light, it would seem they're experiencing connection to the light through that work. I believe that sincerely i think that's possible you know you can the light shines everywhere you know it's the sun you know you can't but that's a super important point you're making and it's connected to the gregorian thing too because when you report then i, I would trust the researcher who goes across cultures and across time what he finds as common denominators are things we should take seriously but those who said i met buddha i met jesus i met muhammad that doesn't matter because the, there's another concept in esoteric I probably timely to introduce to you now, and that's that, and that kind of kills a lot of uh, the the contactee, uh, a lot of the near death experience, etc. And that's the concept that the only way a human being can become enlightened, illuminated, free itself, is to enter a trans personal state and the only way you can enter a transpersonal state is to work with your ego by the way source of the evil in you right and in the east they're very drastic they want to kill disintegrate the ego in the west 
uh, they want to tame the ego and make it a slave for the soul. And most people who say they are um, clairvoyant or mediums, channelers, they haven't worked on themselves for 40 years. They haven't lived in a monastery or went to a, a mountain or whatever. It's many ways to do it. I don't say you have to do it like that. But they have, they're not working on themselves as your proverbial Rumi or your proverbial uh, Buddha or your proverbial Pythagoras, etc. But those masters who have done that, they have battled themselves. And in so doing, they have managed to reach something which is transpersonal. And it's very hard to do. And why transpersonal? Because if you don't do it transpersonal, you're going in the first trap on the path. And the first trap on the path is to see the world through your own lens basically projection. That's what happens when you die and you're a Christian and you see Jesus. The light doesn't care. Okay, this sucker thinks I have to look like a blonde hippie with a beard. Okay, send, manifest that. That's the fo- The mind is so mutable. It's so, uh, it takes on, that's what myths are. And dreams, just go to dreams. Yes. You know dreams yes. aren't supposed to be literal. Dreams build up messages which are non-rational, but they are still reasonable, but they are non-rational, and they use whatever masks they can take from whatever matter you give them from your daily impressions, etc. So that's the problem. And I'm not saying there's nothing real shining through those egos, for example, when they die, because that's why they actually see some light, because the ego is starting to disintegrate. The ego is afraid of the death, not the soul. So something goes through. But if you have a cross-culture, cross-time, then you can start to look at what's really the game here. And I believe, by the way... Can I I just jump in? Because I want to highlight a couple of points that you made. And I really don't have anything to add to them other than to echo them back to you and see if you want to reconstruct them in a different way. But I love the idea about transpersonal and that the ego is, to a certain extent the enemy of this game. And I particularly liked the way that you are offering us to understand the difference between the East and the West and the killing of the ego versus the taming of the ego, because I think each of those has their pluses and minuses, but we tend to not think of it that way. We we tend to think of it as one being right or one being wrong. Do you have any, any additional thoughts on the killing versus taming of the ego? No, it's what you said. There's no right and wrong. It's just that if you put a Western man, send him to Himalaya mountaintop and expect that he's going to succeed that way, you're doing him no favors. If you take, <laughs> if you, same way, if you kidnap a boy who's grown up in a Buddhist cloister and drop him off in New York and say, here, embrace our way, you're doing him no favor. So it's not about right or wrong. It's about which is most effective according to culture, tradition, maybe even genes and, and all sorts of uh, stuff. So we don't even have to go there. Wow, that we do, because that's powerful stuff. Could that partially explain why the stage on this, why the sage on the stage guru winds up fucking all of his female, you know, uh, devotees because he came from a different culture and he wasn't equipped to handle that aspect of this? I disagree. I disagree, actually. I see what you mean, and it could be like that, but I don't think that's the answer. I think it's what Trump says. They're not sending us the best and the brightest. Once a so-called guru goes to the West and wants to spread the word there, you know, meaning pussy and dough (laughs) and big cars, the real gurus will never do that. Real enlightened people don't work like that. They don't need attention. They're not on TV. That's the whole point. That's common, actually, in West and the East. Most circus don't know that, so they go, oh, I, I know him from the this or there, as seen on CNN, whatever. That's, that's when you know it's a mockery. That's uh, the Ill- illusion. That's Satan. The real enlightened people have always strived for anonymity. That's why uh, uh, alchemists, for example, never published anything under the real name. It's unheard of today in our culture because we're so far rem- removed from the zeitgeist of the past. But last time I, I was on, uh, no, I was on your show. I told you that the biggest cult is the common uh, culture that we're in. Cult. Sure. Nice. And uh, so we don't understand that in the old days, the, it was a noble thing 
to be anonymous, to be unknown, to work uh, the light without letting the ego take the the, like I said, the negative force is all about going into details. It's all about separation. It's the ego. Oh, I'm the guru. You have to go through me. That's how they perverted Jesus thing too. Jesus never demanded that uh, people had to like a cult of personality around him. And we can know why he never meant that because we know where he was trained uh, and what the, their philosophy was. So the quacks is my point. Uh, anyway, I'm ranting. No, no, no. I think that's. I think that's excellent. I and I have to, I have to agree with you. I have to, you know, kind of backtrack on what I was saying, and I, I think you're spot on, one hundred percent. But uh, consider this: Satan and Lucifer are not identical, just so you know. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, but it's it's a uh, practical implication too, because you conflated them in uh, practicality too, not just in concept. Well, I never mentioned Lucifer, right? No, but you you mentioned the energies, and you were kind of trying to portray them as the same thing. I'll, I'll explain. Satan is the materialist energy. It's the desire energy. It's the egotistic energy. Lucifer is the rebellious energy. It's the... And, and you were conflating them because you said, oh, they go against culture. You, you, like, like, you, you could probably call Crowley a Luciferian. You see the difference? Yes, he rebelled. Yes, he tried to... Like I told you in an email... Just so this is said, so people know, I regard Crowleyism, Thelem or whatever, as teenage occultism, okay? I'm not impressed okay. by that at all. But I have to defend their virtue here, because there's nothing whatsoever that can justify trying to portray them as like these uh, child raping uh, proverbial satanists that we hear about in the myths and the memes crowley writing crowley writing of the bloody sacrifice for the highest spiritual working one must accordingly choose that victim which contains the greatest and purest force a male child of perfect innocence and high intelligence is the most satisfactory and suitable victim. Yes, and he's saying exactly what I said. He's saying that innocence, purity, is the most effective. You are doing the mistake as those people who re uh, take things literally. You, you, you're reading this as some kind of uh, call to action. This is occult it appears scientists. That it, no, it is a call to action. It appears from the magical records that he made this particular sacrifice on average about 150 times a year. Moreover, the idea that someone in the context of what he was talking about in terms of a system for magic, for manipulation of this spiritual realm – would say that and then we would try and distance ourselves from that or try and be an apologist for that it, no, it no, no. really there it, no you're not an apologist if you have another perspective. That's very important. I'm not a, an apologist for the secret space program because I disagree w with what motor they used to get to the moon. You understand? Further yeah. evidence that Crowley favored the involvement of children in occult rights. This is proven over and over yeah, again. What's the evidence for that? By witnesses who claim, and even in the exchange that you saw that I gave you yeah. between Peter Lavenda and uh, Jason Horsley, who's documented this and written a book about it. There's plenty of, we, we don't have eyewitnesses that say that they saw like a child sacrifice. But in terms of, in terms of what I just said, that he involved the, the, the involvement of children in occult rights, yes, there's eyewitnesses that he had children running around while he was performing the, the, his Ah, uh, no, it was like a hippie commune. I mean, even his own child, Alistair Ataturk, never said that. Why are you apologizing for the guy? Why? why I'm not apologizing. I, I, I actually criticized someone who let their children be naked, and they're like eight, nine years old, you know, sitting on the lap of uh, men who were present and stuff like that. So, so I'm all against that. I scolded the mother for that. But here's the thing. 
that doesn't mean that the mother had the intention of sacrificing the child to uh, some Satan figure. So uh, it's it's kind of the same thing here. But I don't want to waste time discussing Crowley. You can do that uh, with your guest. I want to point out that you have to distinguish between Luciferianism and Satanism. Right. I'm not subscribing to either. But I'm much more sympathetic to Luciferianism because sometimes the rebel powers are needed. When Satan is ruling, so to speak, when the man is the evil, we could use some Luciferianism. And remember, Lucifer means light bringer. But it's two different entities, even when you study uh, history of religion. They've been well, conflated. Well, I think if we go back to the... Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, but all that slips through our fingers, like when we go back to the first... Yeah part of this show when we said, you know, historically there really isn't yeah. even a Satan in the Bible no. and then he, he pops up. So, I mean, it's back to your idea of the Topa Egregorian co-creation thing. But no, it is because, yeah, but because Egregor is, is very powerful. So you have to entertain the fact that, yeah, there is an energy now that is sustained by it. I think it's more sustained by Christians, not by their evil deeds, but by the fact that they insist that it exists. Abrahamists, I should say, Jews, uh, Muslims and Christians, they introduced this concept and there's much more of them than there's people who say, hey, I'm on the team Satan. <laughs> That's almost none. There are some nutcases, but they are not strong enough to keep this going. And, and, and we don't see here. Here's where I'm going with that. I'm not willing to say that they're all nutcases. I'm not willing to say that Crowley is this or that. I, I, I'm more interested in this little segment of the conversation to look at how we're processing this information and how we're processing the deception thing. And the reason I call out your buddy, Peter Lavenda is because to me, it sounds like it feels like a psyop and anyone who's <laughs> been in the conspiracy game for a while yeah. understands the psyop. And if I can, let me rant for a minute okay. on the Gloria Steinem thing, yeah. because I think it's particularly relevant in this case. You know, Gloria Steinem, she's in the news now. They've made a, st a streaming Hulu miniseries on her on this great feminist. Anyone can do this. Go look at the history of Gloria Steinem. She's a bitch. She was C I know. Well, she was CIA from Jump Street. She was not only CIA, but she was like a super duper, really good CIA operative. She started out not in the feminist movement, but working against uh, student organizers and reporting back to her bosses. And they're her bosses. I can read you the quote, if you want, but they're saying, gee, you know, this woman is the greatest. She's firing on all cylinders. She's a, a, a great CIA agent in terms of duping these naive people into thinking she's on her side. Mm. And then where does she wind up? Boom. Next thing you know, she winds up in the feminist organization starting now, which a lot of feminist at the time said, wow, she's taking this thing in a totally yeah. different direction that we were in terms of equality and in terms of respecting everyone. That's how they destroy every creation. Exactly. They always destroy. Uh, so you could say CIA is satanic because a feature wow. of that energy is they can't create anything. They can only destroy. Well, and then, but that gets difficult as well, right? Because in war, we understand that, you know, when we put it in war terms, victory does allow us to perpetuate the light as well. So when there are two evil forces, you got to pick sides. But just to finish the story with uh, with Gloria Steinem, because there's going to be people out there listening to this show who are skeptical of what I'm saying, okay. and they're going to look at the way this was reported in the mainstream media and the Chicago Tribune and another place and then go, oh no, Gloria Steinem came out and she said, yeah, I was part of the CIA, but that was just for a really short time when I was with the women's movement. And you know what? I found that they were really good guys and they were liberal <laughs> and they were open-minded. <laughs> right. And here's what I want to draw people's attention to. Go look at what Gloria Steinem did in 2012 with her, out, uh, her, her claims against Syria. 
and understand that yeah. Syria, that Syria within that that part of the world was the most progressive yeah. secular country going and was battling ISIS, best known for burqa and cutting off arms. Uh, the the probably the greatest oppressor of women's rights that we have any example yeah, of yeah. in our current you know lifetime. So there she is, and she is she pops up now in 2012 with her women under siege movement (laughs) documenting sexualized victims of violence in syria this they pulled the same on gaddafi she she did she did Hmm. this is a lifetime player that that enjoys absolutely how how was she exposed by the way who was she was exposed way by a fellow feminist she nice. did an interview for a feminist uh, publication that totally called her out. She had to admit it, but she spun it again as, well, I had, which is the classic they always do spin. That. Yep. I had to do it for the greater good. Mm. It's the Hitler, right? I had to do it for the greater good. It's also the MK Ultra. We've said it a million times. You know, I, I had to get the job done, and the job was get women their rights so i had to use any means necessary and in this case it was partnering with the cia operation mockingbird never stopped it's never been this strong what what's this uh, cnn guy's name he's a vanderbilt um he's a gay dude oh the guy the um silver fox guy oh yeah yeah um Oh man, now it's He's the most profiled talking head. Yeah, no, I I know now the name the name is going to escape me cuz on the spot. Yeah, like he had this exact same story. It sounds like a go Oh, to, totally. It, it sounds like a go to story. Oh, it was just a period. Oh, I needed to it was before I started in journalism. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> it may even be right because CIA doesn't need to pay journalists. They don't need to pay them. The journalists get a lot of money. The journalist knows that they have to be deliverers, the pushers of the talking points, because that's how they further their careers to earn more money. So the whole system is working for a kind of CIA-ish. It is. They don't need any more to be directly on the uh, payroll, at least not journalists uh, or, or certain politicians, etc. Maybe people like Steinham need to get direct money or, or they have facilitated it so that she gets a lot of money otherwise. But that's how, because they don't want paper trails. They don't want, you know how they took down the mafia boss, Al Capone, right? It was taxes. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's always how they mess up. Well, so they know about it. You know, ba- circling circling back to your one point about Anderson Cooper, who is yeah. the guy we were talking about on, on CNN. That's the guy. Yeah. And the laughing it off. It's a joke. Oh, you think I was the CIA? It's a joke. Oh, you know, it, th- this is a a con. Uh, this is a commonly used tactic in this mode of deception. And again, bringing it back to our other conversation about evil, we can't maybe define always what evil is, but it's kind of has a lot of these common elements. And one is this idea. Again, I hate to pick on. Crowley, but it's this Crowleyan do what thou wilt. I can deceive. I can do whatever I want because look at the look at the defense of Crowley, even that you met. It's oh, it's a joke. That's how they defend that writing that I gave you. No, no. Oh, well, Crowley just said that as a joke. I won't say it's a joke. What I would say is this, and the telemets hate this. But they portray him as some big scholar. I'll give him one thing. He was very experimental. His diaries are, are really should be read like scientist, uh, science uh, journals. But he wasn't a big philosopher or thinker. In fact, what he did was he stole or borrowed or used from many different sources. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, I mean, he wasn't a scholar, so he doesn't have to give sources. And so that do what the will thing, first off, it's completely misunderstood. Uh, it's not even from him. It's actually a very old law. It has to do with free will. It's to do your soul's will, your real will, your true will is to follow the light. If you do that. Oh, it's Gnostic. It's, it's Madame Blavatsky. Yes, yes, it's yes. left hand path. It's all those But then things. comes the hippies. I mean, nobody knew about Crowley, uh, except in esoteric circles until the hippies. That, and then because the Crowley books get over published 
and because the hippies were rebels against the system. They saw here a Luciferian, someone who was rebelling against the established norm, the church, all that stuff. But remember, in Crowley's time, it was Victorian. So now you can have sex with men and women. Now you can dress like you want. Now you can swear. I don't care. And the tabloid press, oh, the evilest man in the world. This was a healthy energy back in the day. Yeah. But then uh, comes the hippies and... All the books are out there, and then people who grow up and are attracted to something else than mainstream religion, they believe is a big deal. And many of them aren't really spiritual. It's just a gimmick. It's a, uh, it's a thing. It's a fad. And so, oh, do what the wilt. Oh, yeah, bro. Yeah, I can do whatever I want, bro. Yeah. That's not what it's about. So you can't blame... Well, maybe you can blame Crowley for it because he pushed it so b big, but it's not really what even Crowley meant, and it's certainly not what the origin of that thesis or, or so-called law is. I get you. I get okay. you. But what a lot of people don't understand, Nuances. what a lot of people don't understand, I don't know if we would agree on this or not, but it is a further uh, manifestation, instantiation of this opposite day SpongeBob thing that I'm talking about. And people need to look at the Sabbatean Frankist, a real group who said, you know, again, they're, nah, again. they're read, they're read, they're genius, cultish understanding. No, you bought into the spin, man. Well, Have you had a scholar on, on uh, the uh, Sabbatean zone? They were persecuted Jews, basically. So that what they needed to do in order to survive was to use the, and that's where the crypto Jew uh, notion comes from that the Nazis love, and which is why this is uh, the conspiracist and the Nazis have found a common uh, love hate in the Frankians, uh, Sabbatists, the, the uh, Sabians. They needed to cloak themselves in the culture they lived, which were either it was Muslim or Christian. It was both. Okay. And so they had different concepts uh, in order to maintain their own existence, which, of course, just like this, uh, you talked about the Zoroastrians, to this day, Zoroastrians are regarded as Satanists by the local uh, fellow Muslims. So we have this phenomenon now that we have groups who are not like the mainstream and they are denoted as evil. The, you are the manifestation of Satan. Burn, burn, kill, kill. And that's what I warned about in the beginning. That's why we need to entertain this in a nuanced way so we understand that we are usually the manifestations of Satan on earth, not some group, not some identity card, not some ethnicity, not some specific way you can identify. You can't identify Satan by the horn or the tail. Once you believe that, you've gone into, you, you're playing his game. That's the opposite, real opposite day here. So okay, but we have to, we have to re, we have to try and pin this to the ground because I'm uh, it's like so many things. I'm understanding yeah. and agreeing with part of what you're saying, but I, I want to pin something to the ground. Like one of the touch points for me on the Sabbatean Frankist thing, and particularly the Frankist thing, is an article on Medium, and I can send it to you, medium.com, yep. by this guy named Anthony Mueller, who looks into this and finds out that he is a direct blood relative of Jacob Frank, mm. right? Mm. So – he goes back and says, I want to understand this history. I want to understand what really was. And what he finds is is not some, you know, kind of, oh, these poor uh, oppressed people. No, it was really this same theme that we've been talking about manifested, you know, like exactly what I said. It's like the title of his article is, if we cannot be saints, let us all be sinners. <laughs> this was their this was their fundamental j principle of their of their group of their cult it, and it of course it attracted people because if you tell people you know yeah. hey man like you're saying you know with the victorians and the crowley thing but it, at any time if you say you know you're held down by all these moral restrictions and people telling you what you can do or what you can't do. I'll tell you what, I got this group and we are really more connected yeah. with God than anyone else. And here's the great part. We can do all, come on, 
gone over. We have orgies every week. You know, we're not supposed to, we're Muslims and we're not supposed to drink alcohol. Oh, fuck that. We do everything exactly yeah. the opposite. Hey, that has a certain appeal. Whether you want to wrap it in some kind of biblical or, or you know, notion or whatever, that, that, that's going to that's gonna sell, baby. That has some legs from a market. No, you're right. And it's exactly the same phenomenon with Crowley. That too attracts people who... Uh, want to go against the grain or just need excuses to follow their own whims and desires and egos. Sure. In fact, I think most followers of Crow, Crow look, Gloria, what's her name again? Gloria Steinem. Steinem has done much more evil, objective evil in the world than Crowley or Jacob Frank ever could dream of attaining. Uh, the interesting thing, I have a book by Colin Wilson, I think. Uh, I forgot what it's called, but you'd love that book. It's about the most crazy messianic guru, like Jonestown types of gurus, fake messiahs throughout history. And Jacob Frank, I think, has a chapter there. So I'm not saying like Jacob Frank is this stable uh, saint or something. Uh, although I wouldn't call Sabians, you know, those who followed Sevi, are not, uh, Jacob Frank is like a local extreme manifestation of that. You're right. But no, you're right. It will attract all sorts of people, no matter what the instigator of that uh, philosophy or idea had in mind. <laughs> it will. But in most cases, we see that it's either people who want to rebel or it's people who just need an excuse to do whatever they want, basically, without having to follow moral codes. And no, they're not saints, but they are like everybody else. They are in the grey landscape. As soon as you pull a Ted Bundy, that's when you're objectively evil. As soon as you start torturing. Absolutely. And uh, like trying to crush souls, not just expressing your ego, but actually crushing other souls, then I would agree. Because if you say why evil matters, well, then... We need to try to have some measures to identify it, because if not, we'll either end up rejecting all evil, like you see the materialists do, or you'll run around pointing to everyone else than yourself as evil, like we see the religious nuts doing. And neither way works. Actually, both way works very well to maintain and sustain evil. <laughs> well but, said. Yeah, but if we want to be warriors here, we have to be smarter than, we can't play into that game. You see what I mean? I do. So I would be very reluctant of pointing to any group per se, because let's take any, any classical conflict. Let's say uh, Israel against Palestinians, which is a very skewed conflict, obviously. No, well, hold on. But before you, before you go down that path, let's stop where you were, because I think it was a really, really... No, it's not uh, a path. I'm just saying there's evil people at both sides and good people at both sides. That's the point. Well, here's, wh here's where I wanted to kind of put a pause on that so we can talk about it more. Yeah. Because I do think we kind of have to make a little bit of a distinction because I agree with you. I think it's really problematic to point at an individual and start calling them evil or point to a group yeah. and call them evil. And it leads to all the kind of problems that you mentioned. At the same time, I do think it's kind of useful, as I was saying, you know, to use the meme term, which is so overused, but to try and tease out some of the common threads, some of the common memes that we see being played out here. And that's why I said, you know, the the Sabatian Frankist thing, and it's like you kind of agree. I mean, and then so to connecting that with Crowley, not Crowley the individual, but hey, it's this opposite day thing again. Isn't that interesting? And then you go over to the West and Memphis Nine and uh, Damian Eccles was like this. Yeah, but but the Catholic Church absolutely is an opposite day from Jesus. Oh, it, it, it totally is. But so, but you know, just so you look at Damian Eccles in the West Memphis Three, and now he's a celebrity, and you know he's on all these shows, and all these celebrities are embracing him, and he's just who's this? The list of fellows in who's this dude? The West Memphis Three was probably one of the most famous cases in the last twenty years of so-called satanic panic. Like ah. you, you look at which is something we should talk about, right? So. Yeah. You Google Damien Eccles, and the first 
I don't know how many entries. They're about satanic panic, satanic panic. Poor Damien Eccles got railroaded into prison and was on death row for a murder that he didn't commit. Well, the facts are murky as to whether or not he committed this murder, murder, but he was released from jail, and that has some meaning. But the facts for whether or not he was engaged deeply in satanic practices and whether he was drinking blood and whether he was performing all sorts of rites and rituals and that there were eyewitnesses that saw him burn a garage and then do a satanic prayer. These things are all things that can be attested to. So one of the, the, the interesting little threads we have to pull out of here is this claim of satanic panic, you know, that everyone's, oh my God, those people are so stupid and everyone sees Satan around every corner. Well, there's an element of truth to that, but there's also an element of truth that this deception by all these different means is part of the playbook that we're dealing with when we look at these forces. It just is. There's no getting around it. Uh, oh, you, you're really making this a uh, complicated uh, discussion today. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way, buddy. No, let's go there. Okay, let's go there. Um, so... There is such a thing as fake and hysteric, like solemn witch thing. Correct, correct. Let's just agree about yes. that. We had it in Norway 20, 30 years ago uh, in the north of Norway. Everybody lost their job. Even the police were arrested. Oh, it was this big pedophile ring. And I have no doubt. There are literally uh, hundreds of people languishing. Yes, languishing yes, we, we'll get to them. But let's first take the fake ones. Yes. No, they're in prison for crimes that they didn't commit because there is this hysteria that yeah. uh, overruns people and it has a religious yeah. overtone a lot of times and all the rest of that. So that's a given. Grown up. And that's why it works very well in America because of the Bible Belt and all that. So, But this was revealed. So this was uh, finally uh, rectified and... Uh, Everybody was let go and there was, oh, the psychologist lost a job because they didn't realize how hypnotherapy, that's a crazy thing, man, because you can get people to remember anything. Satanic rituals, uh, pedophilic uh, molestation. Psychologists know that now. That's why they have much better ground rules for how they will unravel. Because I'm not saying you don't get any useful information from it. I'm just saying the mind, the creative mind, can, if it can manifest, conjure up egregores who look exactly what, what we actually believe, then obviously it can fabricate. Uh, and I, I don't even like the word false memory because it's real to you, right? But anyway, so you have that phenomenon. And then you have the real phenomenon of pedorings. Like uh, Peter Lavender mentioned the Franklin Group, Jimmy Saville, the, the British Royals, the Belgian cult, the Finders. And, oh my God, you have to see this man. You know Dr. Phil, right? Sure. He's my guilty pleasure. <laughs> I have to admit. Yeah, you know, I get you, right? And he had, this was a wake-up call to me, because I've always known there was pedophile rings around, but this claim that the elite, kind of, this is worse than, uh, even worse than um, Epstein. Yes. Because what Phil did, I saw, it's such a weird case, you should look into it. He had worked, spent a lot of resources to get this woman uh, onto his show. And, and he had a plan to follow. He, he doesn't just dwell. When he has his theme things, it goes for weeks, if not months, if you look into his history. So he used a lot of resources and he got this woman on with an FBI. She had FBI agents present to protect her. And what she claimed was insane. It's they are breeding people to become victims of this because that's the safest thing to do. They are super international. So they have these airplanes where they don't even go through customs and stuff. And yeah, private islands and all this stuff. And it's so many people from all sorts of elite, not just celebrities and politicians and all this stuff. And the things they do are way beyond pedophilia, man. Right. It's insane. I, I, I can't even, I mean, it's the most mind-blowing and I've seen 
weird stuff. He has demon possession people on his show. <laughs> that really. And she was like, she was like a robot mm. because she didn't have a, n- a normal life. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't even imagine such a psyche. So she was talking like, actually like a robot and, uh, he was on way deep water. So what do you think of that? What do you think of that, Al? Where does that take you? No, but you? that's not even the interesting thing. The most interesting thing is that it was just one show instead of this big thing. And it was pulled from all the... I, I don't get it in... I don't even have a TV. So I look for, you know, pirate stuff online, right? Sure. This was the goddamn only episode it was impossible to find. Right. I had to spend weeks. Right. And I'm a vacuum cleaner online. I can find anything. And I managed to find, but it was gone. I had to actually put it together by different kind of clips. I don't even know if it's uh, available anymore. So why was this gone? And why was, so something happened there to, because Phil is like a, a crusader. Of, oh, if these people right. exist, oh, I want to help. I want to do good. He's in that right. mental space. But I think he hit a brick wall there. Now, on the one hand, you have the potentiality of something like that existing. They're breeding people. They are treating them worse than animals. Well, you know, you're talking about Lavenda. You're talking about Lavenda reporting on the Finders cult. I had John Brisson, and he's in the book, and he's done more boots on the ground research on the Finders cult. Actually, interviewed like the Tallahassee police that arrested the first arrested the finders cult and he has yeah but there was a cia connection right absolutely and my only point is the breeding was part and parcel of of what they were doing and that like epstein was a brownstone sexual blackmail organ operation and again you know exactly to, that's my point that's what i was going to understand there. it from the cia perspective is to kind of uh, See, I don't know if people are going to be able to follow this dialogue or or not, because we started on such a philosophical up in the air. And I know. We went the opposite direction. That's why I tried to start with the details. But You, you did. You, you did. But you know what? <laughs> Who cares? We've yeah, okay. had the yeah. we've had the you've informed me, you know, you've taken me to the next level. At least but, at yeah. So just so people know, you know, so you look at the finders cult and first you have to understand like Jeffrey Epstein if people people listening to your show are super clued in, so they probably know this, but Jeffrey Epstein was a front man, yeah. and you know a front man because his uh, he has his name on all the shit, right? Yeah. So he owns the townhouse, mm. he owns the island. The real people, like you were talking about, the anonymity. The real people are the people behind it who don't want their name out front. They go, okay, let Jeffrey have his money. Who who gave him the money to do all that stuff. Yeah, we'll give him the money. We'll give him the girls and stuff like Mm. that. Give me the tapes. Give me the blackmail. Give me the information I have to do that. And if you look at this just from a Machiavellian kind of uh, perspective, sexual blackmail of this type is the highest commodity you could get as a CIA agent, right? I mean, you have the video of that uh, Egyptian uh, diplomat in bed with a eight-year-old boy. You own that person for life. There's Mm. nothing they can do. No amount of money. That's Catherine Fitt's point. So it's not about Satan. It's not even about the sexuality. It's about controlling those those who have power. But that is a misstatement, isn't it? Because as we talked for three hours, it is about Satan. It is about this other force. But it is also about this other more force that we can understand in terms of material, in terms of get the job done, conquer that hill. I'm in the CIA. This spends less resources. So I destroyed the life of some eight-year-old. What I got out of it is going to help our country. You want me on that hill. You need me on that hill. But don't mistake that it is still satanic. It is still evil. It is still influenced by that dark. I, I, I see you're satanic and I raise you with this. I agree that there's a correlation there. But I I want to explain it like this and see what you think about it. The minions who manifest this uh, are not into it for the grand evil darkness scheme. They may not even be aware of it. But where they conflate with that energy and become vehicles for that energy is when they are driven by, in this case, well, it's in all cases, power, 
egotism, uh, greed, dominion. That's uh, and power is dangerous because it puts the ego into God's position. Uh, uh, very unnatural yes. because any any natural structure you don't see an ant being a president of the United States. So that's kind of what happens when an ego gets all this power. It wasn't even possible in ancient times to have the power that's possible today. Now it's possible, heck, it's possible probably to rule several planets of creatures. So so they follow those uh, aims, and when they do that, they connect with that energy that may or may not exist there. Uh, or, or, well, let's say it do exist, but that's how it gets into that a scheme and so that's why i'm saying if you want to really battle no i evil. totally hold on i totally agree with you mm -hmm. i just hate when we go down and say this is how it works because we don't know for sure that that's how it works and also it seems to be that like in our own consciousness that we can experience because we are co-creators of this reality, we can manifest it in a million different ways and to get too hung up on it's this way or that way. But you're not doing that. I, I think, I think you're no, doing we know it works like that, man. So I want, I want to do two things. One, I want to draw <clears throat> attention to the point that I completely, all the data I'm getting in suggests that you're absolutely right. That is this ego part of us that seeks to be greater than, greater than the creator God kind of mm. Gnostic kind of thing is that impulse to be, in control to dominate is totally about this in a different way. But then I hate to just say, and it works like this, because I don't know if it always works like that. Well, the pedo has the same. Uh, you said it. It's not about the sex. It's about the power. So even down to the idiot who uh, falls into their blackmailing trap, even he is connected to the same energy. And it's not a theory. You can ob observe it in yourself and you can observe it in others. If you follow, right. if right. you follow a certain path, which has this energy, it will modify your behavior and your ethics over time. You will, you can't resist it if you actively follow it. That's where free will come in. We didn't even touch free will. But so you know that if you, uh, Anyone, you, you, you said they, they, they split their uh, minds. Ego states. Yeah, yeah, yeah in order to achieve this. I think they realized this long ago, that if yes. you do the opposite of the wholeness, you know, the word healing comes from the word whole. If you do the opposite of trying to become one and then transcending the ego and then seeing existence as it really is and not through the fake filter of our culture and our zeitgeist and our religion and our upbringing which is what happens to all these people who have yes they have paranormal experiences but they can't uh, see through the lens the, the the veil that is themselves well, see everything you say touches on like about a million points yeah. let me let me ask you this question kind of in a kind of obscure form but like let's say let's take what you said which is that you know if you play around with this stuff you start understanding that splitting of the ego states has these qualities that may be attractive to you if you're interested in connecting with these extended realms, right? Mm. So that's what we're saying when the MK Ultra says, hey, you know, let's make these people have split personality and then we can, you know, we can mess with it and these other ways, which we haven't even talked about, whether that is an invitation for ET, an invitation for demonic possession, an invitation for some kind of remote viewer kind of thing, whatever. There is some, there's some evidence. There's a lot of evidence that they have tried to operationalize, weaponize the dissociative identity disorder yeah. to do that. And then you pointed out, you come along. And collectively that, too. Yeah. Collectively well, too. Look at American culture today. But hold on, hold on, hold on. Put a, Pause on that for a second, because yeah. then you came along, Alan, you correctly pointed out, you said, yeah, but do you think they freaking inv invented that? And I think you're so right. That's such an important point. We look back and we say, oh, wow, maybe that's what trauma and severe trauma has always been about in these cultures where we can't explain it, why yeah. they're, where they're traumatizing kids. And then if we look even at the positive spin at it, what does rites of passage look like? What does it look like to be, 
you know, almost killed by a sweat lodge uh, journey for three days? What does it look like to be stung by ants? What does it look like all these other things? Confront your fear. Yeah. Are they yeah. somehow tapping into this mechanics of consciousness that once it's split, it has a greater chance of connecting with this extended realm? And then are we identifying that as evil when maybe sometimes it's not. So I think all that spins out of what you just said there. So I want to spin that back to you and see okay. what you think about that, particularly about the rites of passage. Yeah, rites of passage. Cool. That's what I wanted to comment. And I thought that was just a bit of your big point. So I, I say this. Uh, it's the opposite, actually. Uh, again, opposite day. There's so many negations here. Opposite of opposite of opposite. It's like double spy, triple spy. <laughs> you don't even know who, who's working for who. But here, I would venture this. It's actually to help battle evil. Because who's having the quote saying that those who do nothing... Um, something about, I'm, I'm mangling this quote here. Those who say or do nothing are the greatest supporters of evil or something like that. You know what, yeah, what yeah. I'm getting at. So it's the, it's the fear of evil and it's the cowardness. Oh, I don't want to stick out. That's how they can control those who they uh, can't manipulate the morals than, okay, suppress them. And, he never has here's, it been here's more. The, here's the quote. Here's the quote. If you want to yeah. go back and work it in, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. Excellent. Yeah, that's April. So, and here's the thing: you can pervert the entire human race if you are of the light. So, what can you do? You can try to scare, uh, or, or make it. Oh, this is the norm, so I can't go against it. There was probably yes. a, a mother in Aztec culture. Oh, my dear child, but whatever. I'm the freak here because I'm reacting. So, exactly, right. so having, having these initiation rituals are great because early on the man who traditionally was the warrior, the one who was protect, had a role of protection, would now be confronting their worst fears so that in the face of big affairs, and remember in the old days the big fears wasn't connected to nature, which is our big fear today. It wasn't the physical reality, it was connected to the spiritual reality. The night was a horrific thing. The sun was a great thing. Uh, the shadows in the night and all the stuff they were tapping into. I mean, not just imaginations, real vibrations too. So in order to have a man who would be fastened and steady in his own masculinities, in all protection energy, in his own uh, guardian energy, he needed to early on confront those weaknesses. And when he wasn't ev uh, afraid anymore of these spooky things, then he could actually, you know, perform the function as a uh, protector of the light for the life giver, which is another function of the light, which was the mother, right? Nurturer and life nice. giver. So don't fall into the demonization of masculinity uh, principle. Uh, it's not always that easy. And even if it's just a, uh, like mainstream materialistic interpretation, oh, he had to protect the tribe against all the warriors. Fine. But it would be an evil for them that someone is attacking you and you need your young man to be <laughs> not uh, like they would do today, run uh, brilliant, hysterically. Brilliant, brilliant. I love all that, Al. Okay. Let me, let me spin it in a, or let me turn it in a slightly different direction to see what you say. Cause I'm glad you jumped in there and, and talked about the legitimacy of the rite of passage and, and its connection to the light in, in a, and certainly in a, cultural sense inside of those cultures. But here's here's the other thing is that so when we s look at the perversion of that, right, which we're talking about of like, ooh, let me weaponize this through MK Ultra. Let me put yeah. these kids in cages. Let me traumatize them sexually. And boom, lo and behold, they create a split personality yep. and I can penetrate that split personality psychically. Do you think there's a chance that that was discovered you know, before 1940. You know? Yeah, the Inquisition is the is a great example of that. Yeah, no, please, please go ahead. And what about even before that? Do you think? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we could go back, but um, um, so we're trying to find some historic precedents. Is that the point? Well, I mean, I, I, I guess I'm just saying. I, I think you and I intuitively know that we didn't like invent that thing. Uh, anything? No, no, we didn't. Yeah, so it's kind of a common. 
And the thing that's interesting to me, and it kind of relates to the rites of passage thing to a little bit. I mean, all this stuff is interesting, but it as a, as a technology is kind of curious, isn't it? I mean, why, why do I know that I can manipulate you into creating this disassociated ego state and that that will actually have an entry point for uh, this other being. I mean, there is a certain mechanics to that yes. that I can't totally get. No, but you, who you want to discuss exactly that point with is Pharrell, because he has, that's what he's done. He's tracked the mechanics of it through analyzing all sorts of religions, and he's found two trends. There's uh, that as one trend all over the world in all cultures and all religions, and the other is the opposite. You you could basically say the sun cult or the light cult or the growing stuff, harvesting stuff, you know, producing food. Uh, you right. know, it's day and night. And yes, he he even portrays it in the other language. He says it's um, it's the mechanics of it. It's uh. Uh, what does he say? Uh, um, like, like, like it's a science, like it's a practical tool. Yes, indeed. And Let me ask you this then. Do you think that that is possibly a, a misunderstanding on, on our part? Is that possibly another, um, you know, egregorian kind of overlay that we've put on that where we're applying it and at a, at another level, of course, there's no mechanics to it. It just is portrayed that way to us because it further brings us down the, the depths. Of you know, it. look, egregory is not the same as projection. Egregory is a real energy. Okay, that's number one. Number two, you can't argue that, but what you can argue, if you don't want to agree with it, is that, no, it's just a coincidence. It's just a result of how they did it. You can't deny that it exists as a mechanical thing, but you can say, no, nobody intended it like that, or that it was just emerging, like uh, the system just arose by itself and just grew evil by its very nature. We're trapped in a system today, for example, that you can describe like that. But there's no single man behind it who controls it and wants it like that. In fact, we're all trapped in it. And you can go further and you can say, and there's not even an energy behind it that intends it like that. We've created, it's like artificial intelligence. If that was possible to create, I don't think so. We've been going back and forth on that, both of us. But if it was... It wouldn't have a soul, so it would do exactly. so-called evil thing, unless, in my point, that it could be infused with an entity. But let's say it wasn't, and it did all the evil stuff, it killed all human race, not because it desired it or wanted it, it's just a blind system, right? That's the materialist. So that you can say, all that you can say, but you cannot deny the effect and nature of its existence throughout history. You see what I mean? I do. I do. And I, I kind of accept where you're coming from. And at the same time, can can see another way too. in that, you know, we could say, and it's so interesting, the parallels with science and back to the very beginning, when we were talking about, you know, the allure of the shut up and calculate, because if I can just return there for a minute, I mean, one thing that I think some people don't know, particularly kind of just nitwit follow the crowd skeptics when they talk about the woo woo of quantum physics they don't realize that quantum physics has given us the most precise formulas for calculating our observed reality than anything in the history of science that's what got us the iphone that's what got us satellites and the internet that we're talking uh, electric about. universe people would disagree totally well I, I, i'm not sure I'm not sure that they anyway, would in on. terms no, I, I'm not sure that they would in terms of the 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 calculations that we make from you know if we take Niels Bohr and we take his formula and it says okay you can calculate this and it comes this is how this is how close you can get your electrons on on your circuit board before they start jumping back and forth I mean, you, ha you haven't listened to my interview with uh, yeah, Walt Thornhill, that's for sure, because he specifically mentioned um, Niels Bohr and the error. They say both Einstein and Bohr did errors. It doesn't mean everything is rubbish, but it means 
the bi- anyway we, we're going away from the subject go get well, to your well, point we, we, i will get i will get back to you on that and and yeah. then we'll have that discussion but i guess what i'd say is my understanding of it is that the the calculations work so right. it doesn't mean that the underlying principle they may have gotten wrong just like we now know that einstein wasn't really correct and the einstein debate you know debate goes to the einstein niels bohr debate goes to bohr and then you're further saying that no it really needs to be ceded to the electric universe people and i'm open to that uh, i don't i'm not i'm not being a judge i'm just saying you said nobody did know it no there is a disagreement and by the way don't you recognize the quote we we discovered that there was an error in our calculations you know what, what I'm talking about? I think Dolan mentioned that to you. You know, the guy who said we can reach the stars? Uh, what's his name again? Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. Oh, Kit Green. There was an error. Yeah, there was an error in the calculations. Uh, but we've solved it. I'm down with all that. I'm down with all that. But yeah. it, it doesn't take away from the fact that it's kind of like, and just so people, I think this is still an interesting discussion to have, but it's kind of like the the... It's kind of like the the Galileo thing, and or it's really more like the the Isaac Newton thing, right? Mm. It's like Isaac Newton still had some laws that kind of work, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Even though they they lose their explanatory power once you get down to the very quantum level, or when you get up to the other. They don't, the e- e- EU people are much more Newtonian, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they're much, they're, they're good approximations. So mm. let's say that about quantum physics, that, that it's, it's a better okay. approximation for, for how to do things. Cause that was really the, the only point. But why are we discussing quantum physics? Well, you the, were going somewhere and I hijacked. <laughs> right. The, the reason that I was discussing it is really, it gets back to the shut up and calculate mm. and the allure of shut up and calculate mm. the almost irresistible allure. And by that, I mean this idea that we have the math, we've calculated it. This is how it works. And yet when we step back and look at this from a spiritual perspective and the way that we were talking about in the first segment, that can't possibly be true. Right? I mean, it just can't possibly be true. It can be true in this, again, if the analogy, if you don't take it too literally, in this simulated game that we're playing, yeah, we can develop all sorts of rules that kind of work mathematically most of the time, but it's just a freaking game. It's not real reality. And I think that is the spiritual shut up and calculate Mm. to say that I think we have to be very mindful of and not fall for that trap that, oh no, this is how it works. This is what the devil is doing here, or this is what Lucifer is doing here, or this is what God is doing here. You know, do we trust anyone who comes back from their near-death experience and says, tell you what, God laid it all down to me now. I got the download. Let me tell you folks what it's all about. No, because the ego is polluting whatever impulses they were in touch with. I I much more trust the uh, healing prophets. Have you heard about them? Of course. Yeah. So in ancient times, they had this practice called incubation. And that, the, the origin to the word prophet isn't someone who is predicting the future. That's a perversion. A prophet was someone who was able to travel to the other side without dying. But not only that, he also or she had to come back with, and this is very hard, something objective which is valid to everyone. You know, today's religions are one man's psychotic uh, visions and have no practical (laughs) bearing on the rest of us, and we have to believe in that. But here, they had to come back with something all uh, valid and that could be used in the world. Parmenides is is an example of this. So they used these incubations, Hesha-style incubations. They went to the other side and they came back with something, a message, whatever. And to do that, they had to work on themselves for decades. Like yogis, we've discussed this before. They had to lie dead, like in complete silence without moving for many days in complete darkness, in complete silence. So I would trust them when they come back with something. But any random human being who's lost in the big uh, 
picture of what's going on we have enough with ourselves and then something happens that we don't understand i don't care if it's a near death experience or out of body experience or a miracle or a ufo encounter i don't care i don't put value in their interpretations i do put value in the reality of their experience and the seriousness of that and i do also put value in research that tries to find common denominators across culture and time yeah, right. and all that stuff uh, but the most value are put in those few souls who were able to go back to the source and return to us and that's why we have knowledge today which is completely in harmony with the best science about death we have death books from ancient times in different cultures even in the west the Eleusian book of the dead the egyptian book of the dead the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Fantastic. Big accounts. That's not very practical because they use the mythical and magical language, but you have to decode it and inter- uh, translate it to our modern mode of thinking. But we are reaching uh, the end, and I want to ask you about your book first, but you have a comment to this, and then we go to your book. I think that was just extraordinary. Excellent. I love it. Hey, oh, you just said we we're going to kind of wrap things up by talking about a uh, book a little bit. Your book. But I was talking about interpretation of uh, going by literal believing their experiences. So I asked if you had some more comments on the bigger uh, picture. Well, yeah. And I think you were then touching on all the different places that we can go to to find that in all the different traditions and that right, you're right. Uh, like you, you know, I trust the. I mean, I think the gold standard, it isn't always the only standard, but when you start going cross culture and you start going cross time, you start getting your confidence level boosts up a little bit and you go, wow, that's better than just looking at what happened last week. Yeah, right. With, with a random person, right. <laughs> but it's kind of what you do in your book because I notice one interesting thing. I shouldn't be surprised that your book is kind of um, – Similar to the other book in that it it's the same format. Again, you're you're instead of you know ranting on your own thoughts and reflections about it, you're using it through the dynamic with your guests, which is a formula that I notice works very well, especially in this book. Good. Now I I appreciate it more in the former book too. So you have these different guests on, and you're of course you 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 you're staring it somewhere, you're guiding them. But it's very interesting. So many di- – actually, uh, mention to us some of the different people you're, you're talking with in the book and the different perspectives they bring on board. Well, I think as we kind of touched on, you know, I kind of start with the FBI agent who did undercover work with NAMBLA. And, you know, part of the reason that I started there – and it has an interesting, I think, connection to this show – Because, as I mentioned, and I just can't stress how serious I am about this, Mm -hmm. your show really has a unique voice out there in terms of your willingness to dive deep into these. I mean, we're doing four hours here. And when I first talked to you and you said, you got to go, you know, that that was your first thing to me is you got to go long for them. You got to go long for them. (laughs) And I was like, man, what are you talking about? 40 minutes is enough. You know, it's really not. No. And I think I've I've kind of learned that from you. And the other thing I, I love is that you have this kind of broad open-mindedness about, for example, like conspiracies. Mm. And yet you're talking, we're talking, we didn't talk about anything about conspiracies. We spent the whole time talking about philosophical and spiritual stuff. It's my understanding right now that if you can't cross that spectrum – that full range, you just can't get anywhere. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like that first interview in the book, when I talk about Bob Hammer, he's FBI. He's not a conspiracy guy, right? He's talking about the practical aspects of getting convictions on these guys who are doing sex crimes. Mm-hmm. But the way that came about was because when Pizzagate came out, I said, wow, this sounds real to me because <laughs> it fits with the Franklin scandal. It fits with all the rest of the stuff. And there was all this denial and the spirit cooking thing that came out and the John Podesta thing came out and the way you were talking about the, how the Dr. Phil thing just disappeared, you know, mm-hmm. if you're not willing 
to look at the conspiratorial angle on this stuff, hmm. I'm not interested in talking to you because you're you're blinded to but, like. But doesn't doesn't it go both ways? Shouldn't those who are only willing to look at the conspiracy angle also? Absolutely. Yeah. That's my point. Mm-hmm. That's my point. And that's I think the rare territory that you occupy, right? Because mm. we didn't talk about it at all. We talked about the deepest <laughs> Luciferian philosophical Alistair Cra- If you can't cover that zone, cover, try and cover that whole thing, then you're not going to really be interested in this book mm. because that's what I'm interested in. You know, the book is, uh, is about why evil matters not here's another example of evil Mm. it's that it matters because you've been conditioned to look away you've been conditioned to not stare into the abyss which is a good thing you shouldn't stare into the abyss but you need to at least understand what's there so you can acknowledge it, right? Acknowledge it. Mm. So you don't fall into it too. You know, you don't want to mm, stare mm. into it. You can fall into it that way, mm. but you can also not know it's there and trip into it. Mm. So maybe that's, maybe that's what this is about and why it was so just awesome connecting with you on this deeper level. Cause that's what I'm trying to do in the book is kind of just it's a call to arms, you know, it's to say, hey, why are we okay with this? Why are we okay with this not being more of a out front topic? Mm. That, that, that's your intentions. Uh, but a little more on the nitty gritty. You have, for example, I love this chapter name. The devil is a conspiracy. <laughs> Speaking of conspiracy. Exactly. Uh, What's the take there? And, and I see you even have this um, uh, ludicrous, uh, ah, what's his name? This um, professional debunker, what's his name? Often on Joe Rogan show. Michael Shermer? Yeah. By the way, did you know that Anton LaVey, who founded the Church of Satan, he was an atheist? Uh, no, it's true. The, the ultimate Satanism is no. not not all atheists are Satanists, but they share the thing that... Look, we only believe in here and now. We only believe in the ego and in the immediate pleasure of the ego. And we don't care that it's the right of the ego to, to fulfill its needs and desires, no matter other egos. So that's the whole philosophy of Anton Love. Nobody in the occultism took that serious. They were laughing. Oh, he's just a circus artist who's trying to make money here wrote the satanic Bible, blah, blah, blah. But it was that's the rationale of his, and you shouldn't scoff of it because it shows you how close some forms of atheism or materialism actually can be to this energy, just as catalyst is. Oh, totally. I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that. But not necessarily, right? Because like one of the things I point out in the, in the chapter, and the whole chapter isn't about Michael Shermer, but it kind of, it, it's really in that chapter, it's a chapter with the NDE near death experience researcher, David Sunfellow. And I start by saying, you know, I told David, you know, I just had an interview with Michael Sherman. He goes, Oh my God, I cannot <laughs> stomach. That guy. I cannot yeah. Listen. Yeah. And I said, you know, I, I get that. I get that. You know, and cause, cause he completely mishandles the near death experience research. He doesn't get I, it. I, he mishandles everything. He's a pseudo intellectual, right? Okay. He's entertaining. That was my pushback. Okay. I go yep. as a friend of me, Yep, kind of thing. Yep, yep. He's entertaining. I love we it. need to be entertained. What role he's playing in the overall scheme, I don't know. I understand why he why he grates on your teeth. On the other hand, I like the fact that he's so easily kind of pigeonholed with his not pigeonholed that he's so easily handled with his thing. It's the same with Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, who is a, a science showman but is completely is ignorant just. Uh, to, to such a degree on consciousness, this consciousness is an illusion, which is just such a preposterous idea. And we have Bernardo Castor, and I appreciate a public intellectual like Bernardo sticking his neck out and going, that is the most absurd thing I've ever heard a person of his stature say that consciousness is an illusion. So, you know, some of that entertainment push back and forth is necessary, but some of it is, as you're saying, really satanic in that it's kind of hiding a deeper truth and it's kind of 
intentionally trying to deceive people in a way. So however you feel about that, you know, it's mm. maybe it's so great. No, but no, uh, it's important that you said no, not necessarily because, uh, I mean, some of the best people in the world are probably atheists. So no groups, okay? No groups. Is it one thing you need to take away from this talk today, folks, practically speaking, is that the false dichotomy will try to lure you into groupthink. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. always a responsibility at the individual level, which, are, which is why I'm saying to you, look into your own soul if you really want to battle evil. Mm. But no groups, not even Church of Satan. What do I know? Maybe someone grew up, uh, could never express themselves, uh, full of rebellion, blah, blah, blah. Everybody has their story. But when it comes to uh, the take you do in the book, it's so important to have these different perspectives. And you say, we did it today. Yes, we did mention a little conspiracy. We talked about the blackmailing. But yes, uh, let's try to tie it together. Because even if people think, oh, you were just philosophizing, spiritualizing, hypothesizing, conceptualizing, but it's practical too. It's also ties into the nitty gritty details. For example, quick example, Jacques Vallée. Okay, big UFO guy. Yes. Now, I talked about Egregora. Oh, that's like airy fairy stuff. No, no, it's it just another language for the same concepts. Jack Vallée were very close to touching it in his classical books. People should go back to that's when it was best in my view. Read um, Passport to Magonia. Read Invisible College. Read especially Messengers of Deception. Jack Vallée came the closest to identifying the Egregora phenomenon in UFOs. Whether he was aware of it or not, I suspect he was aware of it because uh, in uh, Robert Anton Wilson's self-biography, I think it is, it's revealed that he knows esotericists, even Crowley people. Right. You know, the only problem with that, and I interviewed Jacques Vallée, and he's in the book, although I, w I don't think I was able to send you the clip from there, but he's also misunderstood as being purely a consciousness et explains all kind of thing yeah he's not he's also a guy that connect that collects samples of strange material that seem to be from craft from other universes other yeah he's, he's not an either or guy i agree he is not an either or guy and therein is the deeper discussion that we're having. So, yeah, we are co-creators of this reality and the tulpa and the... Egregora. But consciousness doesn't do it because in the egregora concept, it's materialized. It can be materialized. Well, I mean, we just... We, we just, I think, I, I get that. I just don't hold on to that too tightly because I don't know how it works. But I do think... I'll give an example. I interviewed Dr... Christopher McIntosh recently, and he told me something interesting. Uh, on Iceland, one of the guys who are responsible for reviving the ancient Norse religion, that it's not a coincidence, I used that as an example. He's dead now, but he lived, I don't know when, probably something 70 years ago. He encountered Odin when he was out walking in the forest. <laughs> I think I remember that interview, yeah. Uh -huh. So, bottom line... And, and like well, I said, bottom line, you already, you already said it before. I think you said it, said it quite well. Yeah, that is the bottom line. Yeah. It wouldn't happen in Egypt, right? It had to happen well, on Iceland. That, that was your point. That was your point earlier. And, and you know, mm. you had, you had a ton of great points and we didn't really flesh them out all the way. And that's unfortunate. But you, you said like the, the, the traces of Thor are maybe still in that fabric. Right. And it's kind of reminiscent of a Rupert Sheldrick morphic yes. field kind of thing. Yes. Exactly that. It's that, well, that becomes a weaker force in the field over time, but it's... But I don't, think, I don't think if Sheldrick would admit to it manifesting uh, 3D, would he? So uh, whether he would or not, I mean, that's the other, this is like another kind of whole other topic. But, but that's where Valet went, you know, for UFOs. Well, but one of the things I think we have to do is we have to, just like, like Sheldrick, I mean, let's mm -hmm. celebrate what an awesome idea that was, you know, to, to kind of understand a morphic field, even if it isn't perfect. Mm -hmm. I sometimes get mad at people like Jeffrey Kripal was on the show, you know, and Jeffrey Kripal is a gift. He's a genius. He's terrific. So if I get mad on him because he doesn't, he, he kind of is too accepting of the rut in the road that religious studies has fallen into, you know, we've we got to be able to 
not knock people down and uh, really lift them up and say, wow, isn't that awesome what that person yeah. has done? Yeah. And at the same time, be able to say, you know, I, I, I wish Joseph Farrell would – own up to his idea that the 1947 craft at Roswell was, was not. Ah, you know, that's your beef with him. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he tries to backpedal from that, but he can never completely go, oh, shit, how did I ever believe that? You know what I mean? No, no, he believes it. I, I agree with him. But no, let that rest. Uh, you have Dean Raid in here, I see. How would he end up in an evil book? Ah, uh, you 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 have not uh, heard of uh, Dean Radin's latest book on spirits. Oh, and that's I, right. That's right. And, and <laughs> so so interesting in a way, in that you know, again, Dean is. No, wait a minute on spirits or on magic, because he wrote a book about magic, right? Is that the book? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. And right. in that book, in that book, <laughs> and again, this sounds. I mean, I think. I think. Dean is a giant. We stand on the shoulders yeah. of Dean Radin and the huge contribution he's made, shifting us pivot point from this shut up and calculate craziness that we're so consumed with. He is an absolute giant. But when I hear him talk about magic and I hear him say, up until a year ago, I didn't even take seriously the notion of spirit, I'm like, Okay, Dean, you are a genius, but <laughs> you got some catching up to do here, buddy. It, I understand where that comes from because that is the pure uh, scientist in the lab person. Yeah, he's not a generalist. I mean, you can't be a professor in everything, right? So, right, right. So we, we have to at least he at least he realized and acknowledged it. That's what I'm saying. More and, than and his he will, fellow, and he will therefore. I mean, I trust that he will make some phenomenal contributions along the lines mm. that I'm talking about that we need to make in terms of, you know, sh penetrating this a little bit and not just going, oh, golly, no one could ever figure that out. They've right, been talking right, about right. that for thousands of years. Well, you know, what else are we going to do? Let's figure it out. Right. And Anneke Lucas, obviously her contribution is her own personal history, back to the pedophile thing. And I'm guessing Dolan is in your book from the UFO angle of evil. Yeah, because Dolan is a super interesting guy. And have you talked to him yet or you're about to talk? You haven't published. Yeah, I have talked with him a couple of years ago, but uh, finally get him on in two days, folks. I'll revisit. Uh, nice. Yeah, nice. Dolan, yeah. Can't wait to hear that one because... Mm couple interesting things about Dolan that you might want to just dip into mm -hmm. is one, the video that he did with his wife on good ET versus bad ET is powerful, powerful stuff. Oh, I think I've seen it. Because his wife... Yeah, it's, it's, it's a r rather recent, right? This year or something. Yeah. yeah, or maybe last year. Okay. But his wife is a, a, a survivor, a victim an abductee. Oh, wow. She would not consider herself an experiencer. And that is a question that I asked Richard. And that's what he said. And her account is that it was not, you know, voluntary on any level that she understands it. And that that represents evil in the way that she thinks about it. Mm. And Richard, I think was pretty, pretty, firm on the idea that there's a certain naivete that emerges in the UFO community that wants to see ET as light and love and wants yeah. to therefore ignore some of these other things. The other thing that I think is interesting about Richard and the story he told in my interview, which I, I, he's such a talk about another gift. I mean, we stand on the shoulders of Richard Dolan too, because he is a giant. He's just done incredible, incredible work in the UFO field. But he talks about the story of the communicate after death communication with his father who flicked the lights on and off. And you could tell Richard was uncomfortable with the story because he <laughs> experienced it. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet it didn't exactly, he didn't know exactly how to fit that in with, you know, his, his in general, his, his life, his belief systems and stuff like that. Although he's a super open guy. So he, he, you know, he's telling it publicly. He's not like mm. turning a blind eye to the story, but he's uncomfortable in the way that we're all uncomfortable with. What the heck does that mean mm. that dad is turning off the lights? Right. No, no, I'm with you. It's, uh, <laughs> 
I like Richard's uh, way of thinking and I like his personality. So it's very vivid in my mind when you describe it here. Dr. Diana Pasulka is in the book. And oh, that is. I booked her. Have you, have you, yeah. have you read, have you read American Cosmic? She sent it to me. I read parts of it. I was only interested in talking with her for one part of it. Not actually, we've touched many of the areas she's into. So she sent me, yeah, yeah, I'll come on your show, everything. And then she evaporated. She doesn't reply to my mails. And I don't know what happened there. It's impossible to, to nail her, to get her on. Um, keep, keep trying. I'd say, you know, keep, keep trying. You know, I think so the, it could just be, I think she swamped. Yeah. Or they go through, you know, I think these, these guys go through, uh, periods of, um, where they feel like they need to get out and do the stuff. And then they go through periods where, you know, either their publisher or some other person is saying, you know, no, you need to finish the next book or whatever okay. the hell you're doing. Okay, But if we were like just about to nail the date, she even sent me her book. So I was imagining. Maybe. She is super nice. She is a super nice, sweet person. She's a Catholic, which I can't, I can't. I don't know how she maintains that, but I mean. No, no, that's totally okay. And there's nice people in every religion. Yeah, I mean, cut, cut that out if you would. Edit that out because I don't want to sound like I'm snipping at her, but it's like, oh, it's an incredible. No, you're, sni- you're snipping at Catholicism, not at her. <laughs> you're saying she's a nice person despite being a Catholic. I, I don't I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't, I don't, it's one of those things. You, you know, you can meet Muslims, you can meet nice person everywhere, and you can meet evil Buddhists. No, I, I, but that's not the point. The point to me is the, is like we were talking about earlier. It's like, if you think 9-11, if you don't think 9-11 was an inside job, right, right. you know, well, we're not going to have a very deep conversation unless, you know, you just never knew. And I can tell you, well, you know, building seven, you know, it didn't yeah, get Yeah, but religion know. is tight emotions, not uh, well, intellect. Well, but... Well, t- at this point, though, you got to be able to kind of climb out of that, right? I mean, <laughs> you're such a crusader. I don't. So, so then you can't say there's good people or atheists after all, if you if you can't distinguish between personality and identification. I can't imagine being more lost and confused than being an atheist. I mean, that is the okay. ultimate. So that's even worse than being a Catholic. Oh God, yes. I mean, that is, that is just... <laughs> That is just okay. brain dead, you know? It's like, nope, there's no meaning to any of this. Please, can I keep this little segment in the show? It's such a great entertainment value. Uh, of course you can. <laughs> uh, we should really have a list of Alex's, you know, give us the, the bad guy list from super evil <laughs> to right. just useful idiot. No. You, you know, I don't, I don't think it is evil, but what I do think of it as is the litmus test. Right. You know, the litmus test. Yes. It's like, if you can't pass this test, then, uh, you know, please unsubscribe. You know? <laughs> please <laughs> unsubscribe. But, but what's your contribution to your book uh, as far as evil goes? What, what, what do you mean? Uh, Diana. Uh, why is she in this oh, book? I, Diana's fun, phenomenal in what she's her you read did you read american cosmic uh not all of it just a segment that i want to interview her about well again we we live but i listened to your show uh, and you went many places with her so i understand yeah 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 i mean the the thing in the desert is just mind-blowing and people yeah. need to so here is a religious scholar from north carolina i'm pretty sure chair of her department tenured an academic with, you know, high credentials and all this. And first of all, big hats off to her for she publishes this account of this Catholic uh, saint and their experience. And a friend of hers said, wow, that sounds like a UFO encounter. Mm. And she goes, "Ah." (laughs) he goes, no, it sounds like a UFO encounter. Mm. it stirs something in her and she starts looking at it. And she goes, ah, I see where people would say that. Hey, there's a UFO conference right here in my backyard. She goes, she attends it and she meets Chris Bledsoe. And if anyone hasn't heard the five part interview series that Dolan does with Chris Bledsoe, you got to get that under your belt because it's just okay. critical, I haven't heard it. foundational kind of understanding of an 
unbelievable UFO counter in, witnessed by multiple people, him, family, friends at different at times, all attest to the same thing. An experience that leads to what he thinks he claims is an angelic experience. It transfers from a UFO ET experience later, years later, as he gets closer and closer to the being, he, it transitions into an angelic experience, wherever you want to go with that. The point being, I digress, man. See, we could talk for more and more. So Diana Walsh Pasolka, Dr. Pasolka meets Chris Bledsoe and her mind is blown. Now she's in the game. And the next thing you know, she's out in the desert with a highly regarded academician and with this crazy character who takes on the pseudonym of Tyler Durden from Fight Club. Yeah. And they're looking for space jump in the New Mexico desert, which he routinely finds and reverse engineers into biomedication stuff that allows him to live this lavish lifestyle, fly in Uber jets and stay at the Ritz Carlton Hotel and have thousand dollar lunches. This is why I want her own. Yeah, this is can you spell the classified space program? I don't care that her approach is it's a crashed UFO. It's still a classified space program. So that's a very valuable contribution. It's amazing that uh, she was allowed to publish it. But if she's tenured, I can see why she's uh, going. Uh, she's doing something unusual in academia. She's searching for the truth. And I can see why, because it's like the Robert Shock thing, right? She's tenured. So she has the liberty to actually. Most people who become tenured, they are so um, bogged down. so Indoctrinated, so yeah. Indoctrinated. And the truth isn't on their map anymore. But it, probably the Catholicism saved her. So that's uh, at least one good thing with it. I think you're probably right. <laughs> I think you're probably spot on. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I want to say one more thing about your book. Uh, you have heard an old joke. What's matter? What's the matter? No, what's matter? Never mind. Uh -huh. What's mind? No matter. I love it. <laughs> that is yeah, so, yeah, that yeah. Is right. It's perfect. Brilliant. Yeah. Now, I ask you the title of your book. I don't know if it was deliberate, even better if it wasn't, but it's called Why Evil Matters. Three words there. Matter, evil, why? That's in reverse. Oh my gosh! Yeah, you were so <laughs> oh, that sums up our discussion today. Matter, evil, why? Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> so, Al, only you, only you could see that. <laughs> I did not see that, and I think it's a, a brilliant, you know, insight that you you can you can have on a subconscious level, and then it, right. it emerges. So that's thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Great. Uh, by the way, uh, speaking of reverse, uh, you know that a classical aspect of evil in religion is that it's reversed, right? Yes. It's the reverser. That's why the first thing you should do when you <laughs> make a book about evil is exactly to have that. And, and you did it subconsciously. <laughs> you had that reversal. If, you know, the evil is to do it backwards and the good is to do it. That's the origin to the, uh, you know, left yes. and right. Yes. So my last question to you is, why does evil matter? Well, again, it gets back to this thing that we're talking about at the beginning about, you know, the first book was really like, gee, if you're not willing to come down one side or another on consciousness, you have no business doing science. Mm. You know, you got to figure that out first. And I guess... I feel kind of the same way about spirituality and evil in the sense that the way I put it is, you know, it's a lens. It's, it's a shock therapy entry point to kind of understanding these parts of human consciousness that are beyond the uh, mind equals brain materialism. There's this extended realm to consciousness that we appreciate and we need an, an entry point into it. And I think evil, as strange as it is, can be that 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 entry point. Mm. Mm. OK, fair enough. OK, it's been I think it was a blast, wasn't it? Absolutely, man. Are you kidding? You know, I was so looking forward to this. 
and it just hasn't disappointed. I I had this marked on my calendar like and I have to get the audio to this because yeah, I'll it. as soon as you can as soon as you can get it to me and it doesn't have to be edited perfectly because there's bits that I want to pull out and you know are going to inform and work its way into the book because I'm still wrapping it up and there's some critical pieces that we talked about here. Yeah, you'll have part 1 in a week and part 2 in in 2 weeks. That's that's fine my friend. Anything. Okay, I guess that's it for for now then. So uh, thank you a lot for coming on. It was, you know, it wasn't my choice. It wasn't your choice. It was perfect synchronicity. Awesome. I didn't know you were writing the book, you know. No, it was it was incredibly <laughs> synchronistic. <laughs> Al, you're the best, buddy. Thanks. Uh, Take care. Right, I got you. Keep bro. doing what you're doing. Yeah. Have a great day now. See you. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. 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 So far today. Now, if you want Alex's full take on the subject matter, I suggest getting his book when it's out. Well, I suppose listening to his many shows about the topic will also give away his own approach. But so much for the everyday perceivable evil. As for the more metaphysical aspects... I'm going to end this show with a little treat for you. I'm going to read from the autobiography of Robert Anton Wilson, one of the authors of the Illuminatus trilogy. And keep in mind, this is from 1974. This is from a chapter where Wilson describes one of the big shot parties he went to, like, uh, I don't know what to call it, like a esoteric party maybe I've been to... <laughs> <laughs> Enough of those myself. <laughs> so it's uh, all sorts of different kind of weird and strange people there. You, you'll recognize some of them. I'll jump right in. The party was just starting. The kind of noisy party you find only in Berkeley and among hippies and witches practicing psychotherapy without a license. When I was called to the phone for a bitch of a conversation, my caller was a Dr. H, who is a very gifted psychiatrist. It seemed that he was having a bad acid trip, couldn't get control of the anxiety, and wanted my help in dealing with people on bad acid trips. I'd never done it over the phone before. Twenty minutes later, when Dr. H was calmed and going off into a good trip, I felt absolutely drained and returned to the living room. Immediately, Tom sat down next to me, laughed shrilly, cracked a silly joke and said, I think I may be going crazy again. He had been in a nut house for a few months, about eight years before. Tom was convinced, finally, that he didn't have to go crazy again, that he was the programmer of his own computer, and that it had only been a hallucination that made him think the computer was starting to program him. I was now even more drained, and then Jacques Vallée arrived. I had wanted to talk to Dr. Vallée for several months now, and I immediately kidnapped him into a room which the other partygoers were not informed about. On the way, we spotted Grady McMurtry, Caliph of the Ordo Templi Orientis, or OTO, and his wife Phyllis. Tom, still jiggling at inappropriate moments, but no longer sure he was going mad, tagged along. The skeptic had heard Jacques Vallée talk at a conference on science and spirit sponsored by the Theosophical Society earlier in the year. He had taken a new approach to the UFO mystery and was systematically feeding all the reports of extraterrestrial contacts into a giant computer. The computer was programmed to look for various possible repeated patterns. Jacques said that the evidence emerging suggested to him that the UFOs weren't extraterrestrial at all, but that they seemed to be intelligent systems intent on convincing us they were extraterrestrial. Now the skeptic started pumping Jacques about his evidence that they weren't extraterrestrial. He started to explain that, analyzing the reports chronologically, it appeared that they, whoever or whatever they are, always strive to give the impression that they are something the society they are visiting can understand, 
In medieval sightings, he said, they called themselves angels. In the great 1902 flap in several states, one of the craft spoke to a West Virginia farmer and said they were an airship invented and flown from Kansas. In the 40s and 50s sightings, they often said they were from Venus, since Venus has been examined and seems incapable of supporting life, they now say they are from another star system in this galaxy. Where do you think they come from? I asked. Dr. Velay gave the Gallic form of the classic scientific, not speculating beyond the data head shake. I can theorize and theorize endlessly, he said. But is it not better to just study the data? more deeply and look for clues? You must have some personal hunch, I insisted. He gave in gracefully. They relate to space-time in ways for which we have, at present, no concepts, he said. They cannot explain to us, because we are not ready to understand. I asked Grady McMurtry if Alistair Crowley had ever said anything to him implying the extraterrestrial theory which Kenneth Grant, head of an other OTO, implies in his accounts of Crowley's contacts with higher intelligences. Some of the things Alistair said to me, Grady replied carefully, could be interpreted as hints pointing that way. He went on to quote Crowley's aphorisms about various of the standard entities contacted by magic. The abramaline spirits, for instance, need to be watched carefully. They bite, Alistair explained in his best deadpan, am I kidding or not, style. The Enochian angels, on the other hand, don't always have to be summoned. When you're ready, they come for you, Alistair said flatly. The outstanding quality of UFO contactees Jacques Vallée said at this point, was incoherence. I now have grave reservations about all physical details they supply, he said. They are like people after an auto accident. All they know is that something very serious has happened to them. Only the fact that so many cases involve other witnesses who see something in the sky before the contactee has his, her strange experience justifies the assumption that what happens is more than subjective. Largely, Dr. Vallée summarized, they come out of it with a new perspective on humanity, a religious perspective in general terms. But all the details are contradictory and confusing. He regarded green man, purple giant man, physical craft with windows in them, etc., as falling into the category psychologists call substitute memory, always provided by the ingenious brain when the actual experience is too shocking to be classified. I asked how many in the room had experienced the contact of what appeared to be higher intelligence. Grady and Phyllis McMurtry put up their hands, as did two young magicians from the L.A. area, and myself. Jacques Vallée curiously looked as if he might raise his hand, but then evidently changed his mind and did not. I said I inclined to believe the higher intelligences were extraterrestrial, and asked what the others thought. Grady McMurtry, caliph of the OTO, said, in effect, that the theory of higher dimensions made more sense to him than the extraterrestrial theory in terms of actual spaceship entering our biosphere. The two L.A. magicians agreed. Tom, who had been a witch for five years and hadn't raised his hand when asked for contactee testimony, said that the higher intelligences are embedded in our language and numbers, as the Kabbalists think, and have no other kind of existence. He added that every time he tried to explain this, he saw that people thought he was going schizophrenic, and he began to fear that they might be right, so he preferred not to talk about it at all. Tom, who is a computer programmer by profession, a witch only by religion, later added a bit to this, saying that all that exists is information and coding. 
We only imagine we have bodies and live in space-time dimensions. Dr. Vallée listened to all this with a bland smile and did not seem to regard any of us as mad. Since everybody in the room at this point had either had the required experience or was willing to speculate about it and study it objectively rather than merely banishing it with the label hallucination, I went into my rap about the parallels between Timothy Leary and Wilhelm Reich. The attempt to destroy both Dr. Reich and Dr. Leary reached its most intense peak right after they reported their extraterrestrial contacts, I said. I keep having very weird theories about what that means. Grady McMurtry nodded vigorously. That's the $64,000 question, he said empathetically. For years, I've been asking Phyllis and everybody else I know, why does the gnosis always get busted? Every single time the energy is raised and large-scale group illuminations are occurring, the local branch of the Inquisition kills it dead. Why? 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 Nobody had any very conclusive ideas. I'll tell you what I think, Grady said. There's war in heaven. The higher intelligences, whoever they are, aren't all playing on the same team. Some of them are trying to encourage our evolution to higher levels, and some of them want to keep us stuck just where we are. According to Grady, some occult lodges are working with those non-human intelligences who want to accelerate human evolution, but some of the others are working with the intelligences who wish to keep us near an animal level of awareness. This is a standard idea in occult circles, and it can safely be stated without exaggeration that every school or lodge of adepts that exists is regarded by some of the others as belonging to the Black Brotherhood of the Evil Path. Grady's own OTO indeed has been accused of this more often than have most other occult lodges. I've personally maintained my good chair and staved off paranoia, while moving among various occult groups as student or participant, by always adhering rigidly to the standard Anglo-Saxon legal maxim that every accused person must be regarded as innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. This obviously spares me a lot of worry, but the more guarded approach is very well argued by Isaac Bonevitz, the author of Real Magic, who said, Paranoid magicians outlive the others. Somehow the conversation drifted away from Grady's concept of war in heaven. Several times Grady tried to steer us back there, but each time he wandered on to a different subject. Tom said later that he felt a presence in the room, deliberately pushing us away from that topic. A few days later, in discussion with the former Vecaville prison psychologist, Dr. Wesley Heiler, I asked him what he really thought of Dr. Larry's extraterrestrial contacts, specifically since he didn't regard Larry as crazy or hallucinating, what was happening when Larry thought he was receiving extraterrestrial communications. Every man and woman who reaches the higher levels of spiritual and intellectual development, Dr. Heiler said calmly, feels the presence of a higher intelligence. Our theories are all unproven. Socrates called it his daimon. Others call it gods or angels. Larry calls it extraterrestrial. Maybe it's just another part of our brain, a part we usually don't use. Who knows? And that's it. Thanks for listening, for your support, and to my team. As ever, I've been your host, Al. Until next time, be safe and be seeing you. Who is number one?